Jesus invented the wheel. Well, we've been through that one before, likely many people over time. But consider why the wheel is such an act of genius. It can move stuff faster and more efficiently, yes, but can also do so, going now one way and then the next, in the opposite direction. What about the fork? What genius invented that? Well, again, maybe several or a lot of people over time. The fork may have started life as a simple stick used to put meat into a fire, but the meat fell off. Oh, how, to, how to hold it more securely? Of course, a double-pronged stick, and then a triple-pronged stick. But why remove the hot meat and eat it with your hands? Wouldn't it be more efficient? Again, simply to flip the multi-pronged stick in the opposite direction and pluck the meat directly into your mouth? Eureka! From a contrarian idea was born what we call the eating fork. Other great moments of contrary thinking throughout history. To discover the East, Columbus sailed west. To cure people of smallpox, Jenner injected them with pox, actually less lethal cowpox. Kanye West said, nothing in life is promised except death. Shakespeare's Hamlet said, I must be cruel only to be kind. Isaac Newton's third law of motion says that for every action there is an opposite and equal reaction. That's why these rockets blast up with a force pushing down. In 1747, Johann Sebastian Bach wrote a contrarian composition for the king of Prussia, Frederick the Great part of Bach's musical offering for that king. The music is set carefully so that it can go backward and forward simultaneously. He composed only one line, but did so in a way that that line could go simultaneously beginning to end, the top of the score there, or end to the beginning, the bottom of the score, and the two could go together. Let's play it. In music, we call a line that goes forward and then backward a retrograde. It might also be called a musical palindrome. Mozart, Haydn, and many other composers executed this sort of trick. But why? Why would so many composers want to do this, spend time figuring out such musical puzzles? Well, why do so many people start each day with a crossword puzzle? It's good mental exercise. It forces us to think about possibilities. It forces us as it did genius Bach, to develop a different kind of thinking. Contrarian geniuses like to think against the grain. Contrarian thinking makes us comfortable with ambiguity. Hey, maybe both of these positions or ideas are correct at the same time. That's the way Albert Einstein was thinking when he realized that light could be both waves and rays, which led to a scientific paper on the photoelectric effect, which won him a Nobel Prize in 1921. And finally, seeing the opposite of things is the basis of all humor, which makes us laugh, a sure sign of momentary happiness. Allow me to continue, please, to, to work through a series of examples of how geniuses over the centuries, from math and science, to painting and to literature and drama, to political activism, to comedy and humor have used contrarian or opposite thinking to their advantage. Let's start with math and young prodigy and genius Carl Friedrich Gauss. In 1785, when mathematical genius Gauss was only eight, his teacher asked him to solve the following problem, one that the teacher surely thought would take forever, probably trying to get the precocious kid out of his hair for a while. The question? Quote, what is the sum of all the numbers from one to a hundred? Well, how would you or I proceed? Well, likely we'd start adding one plus one equals three plus four, that's seven, and so on we would go. 
It would take a long time. But eight-year-old Gauss came back with the answer almost immediately. 5,050. Instead of wasting time adding up all the numbers, he had a contrarian insight. 50 is the midpoint, and the extremes of each side of 50 can be offset against each other, one by one, in the form of a palindrome. For non-geniuses such as I, I'll reduce the numbers from 100 down to 10 and set up a row of 10 and its opposite. Adding vertically, we then get 10 units of 11, or 110. But we've doubled the numbers, add a second row that goes backwards. So now we have to divide by 2 to get the answer 55. Of course, abstraction and simplification and uniform applicability is at the heart of much science and math. And that's what geniuses do, geniuses such as Einstein. Here, what Gauss conceived can be reduced to a formula. T equals n times n plus 1 divided by 2. Try it. It works out for any sequence of numbers. Now, that's genius. From math to chemistry and microbiology, we all were afflicted during the years 20, 2020, 2021, 2022 with a pandemic involving the COVID virus. The United States was able to develop vaccines quickly in part because it was using a new type of technology called CRISPR, which stands for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats. And as mentioned before, Research in this field is what earned Jennifer Doudna and Emmanuel Charpentier the Nobel Prize for Chemistry in 2020. Again, I've got to be honest here, I don't really understand very much of this. But short palindromic repeats seems to be short palindromic fragments of DNA involving retrograding patterns of nucleotides. Between the repeating patterns sit spacers, and into the spacers can be sent bits of mRNA to stimulate the growth of spike proteins, antibodies, that stop an invading virus. You can see these short palindromic repeats of nucleotides identified with abbreviations A, C, G, T. Here, a short palindromic repeat is G, C, T, A, A, T, C, G. So it seems as if Retrograde motion, or palindromic repeats, is part of the genetic code and the genius of all living things. From biochemistry to art and art history, of course, we all know that Leonardo da Vinci wrote backward, and there's a practical reason for that. If you're left-handed, as Leonardo was, and you write left to right, you're continually moving your hand through fresh, wet ink. But Leonardo's Handwriting was not the only thing of his that went backward. In his mind, he had the capacity to see the world in mirror image. On the screen, you see a portion of a sketch done by Leonardo around the year 1478. The sketch is called Madonna and Child with the Infant St. John the Baptist and other studies. Among the other studies are two aggressively striding adolescent male nudes, or is the sketch of one and the same nude seen from opposing vantage points? Later, around 1500, Leonardo engaged in experiments with fluid dynamics, with rivulets, here seen forward and backwards, which leads him to think about vortices in the human heart and how the aortic valve might close. But again, the point here is that Leonardo's almost miraculous eye allowed him to envisage and freeze frame on both sides of a process simultaneously. But of course, most of us think of Leonardo as a painter. How does contrarian thinking fit in here? Well, by way of an example, consider Leonardo's famous The Virgin and St. Anne. Here's the still unfinished painting as it looks today in the Louvre in Paris. But it didn't always look that way in Leonardo's mind. This oil painting started as a series of sketches in which Leonardo seems uncertain as to whether to the layout of the figure should go left to right, the cat here is simply a placeholder for the Christ child, or right to left. Remember, 
Leonardo could write left to right or write to left with equal fluency. Now, ultimately, around 1499, Leonardo settled on the left to right composition, shown on the left side of the screen. But notice that in the cartoon, again on the left side of the screen, the heads of the adults are now in opposition, and so are those of the children, St. John and the Christ child to be. In the final version, albeit still unfinished painting, in the final version, the opposition is framed, so to speak, in a way that Anne and Mary now turn toward John and the mystical lamb, and they turn toward Mary and Anne. This painting, as well as a painting of the adult St. John the Baptist and the Mona Lisa, were the three paintings that genius Leonardo carried with him and on which he continued to obsess to the end of his life, which occurred in France in 1519. And this explains why these three paintings ended up in the French Louvre. Why does lightning strike? Extremes of positive and negative electricity race towards each other from above and below. When they meet, we hear a thunderous result. Why do tornadoes form? A confrontation of extreme high pressure with cold, dry air meets an extreme low pressure with warm, moist air, and a whirlwind results. How does one create drama in the theater? Yes, there's a confrontation, a meeting of opposite opinions or desires. Maybe that's why a play is called a drama. Think of the dramas of Shakespeare and arguably the most gruesome scene, the bloody murder of King Duncan by Macbeth and Lady Macbeth. What does Shakespeare follow the murder scene with? The comic scene of the drunken porter, the polar opposite. To appreciate what makes genius, consider a passage that Shakespeare wrote for Romeo in his drama Romeo and Juliet. Here the lover feels a string of contradictions We'll call them oxymorons, 14 oxymorons in eight lines. Some of these oxymorons we might be able to think of. Heavy lightness and cold fire, but brawling love and feather of lead, there's the creative genius. Here's what Shakespeare put into the mouth of Romeo to express that character's conflicted, almost tortured view of love. Here's much to do with hate, but more with love. Why then, O oh, brawling love, O oh, loving hate, O oh, anything of nothing first create? O oh, heavy lightness, serious vanity, misshapen chaos of well-seeming forms, feather of lead, bright smoke, cold fire, sick health, still waking sleep. That is not what it is. This love feel I that feel no love in this. He's in love, but he doesn't love it. Finally, consider the staying power of Shakespeare's most succinct oxymoron, one in which he creates existential ambiguity by juxtaposing two opposite but incompatible conditions, to be or not to be. How does the genius change the world, the modern political world, sometimes by turning to contrary action? Mahatma Gandhi employed non-action, hunger strikes, going without food, and passive non-resistance to achieve independence for India. In 1947, Martin Luther King Jr., a disciple of Gandhi, employed passive resistance as a tool against the water cannons and police dogs directed against blacks in Alabama. King's most effective and justly famous speech is his I Have a Dream speech, delivered at the Lincoln Memorial in 1963. The text is Shakespearean in its use of oxymorons. Here, opposite images form poetry with a political agenda. The dark and desolate valley of segregation contrasts with the sunlit path of racial justice. The sweltering summer of the Negro's legitimate discontent contrasts with the invigorating autumn of freedom and equality. 1963 is not an end, but a beginning. We shall always march ahead. We should, cannot turn back. Sweltering with the heat of oppression is transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. And then come 
oxymoronic references to the book of Psalms. Every valley shall be exalted, every hill and mountain shall be made low. The rough places shall be made plain, and the crooked places be made straight. And finally, toward the conclusion, quote, we shall be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood, a dramatic musical use of opposites. And with such words as these, genius Martin Luther King Jr. changed the course of race relationship in the United States. Moving on to the world of modern industry and technology, Henry Ford revolutionized factory work in the United States when he invented assembly line production. A visit to a slaughterhouse in Chicago had impressed him with the speed and efficiency with which a dead steer hanging from its heels and pulled along a steel chain could be disassembled to nothing. If you could take a large object apart quickly, could you not put a large object, for example, an automobile, together quickly? While working at a hedge fund, the aim of which is to pick one investment to hedge against another or serve as a counterweight against another, while working at a hedge fund in the early 1990s, Jeff Bezos saw that the internet was expanding at the astounding rate of 2,300% each year and recognized that the internet would be a big solution. So he went in search of a problem. The problem was shopping. It's a very inefficient way of acquiring goods. You drive around to find something, you can't find what you want, so you have to drive somewhere else. Now, you just go to your computer and the stuff comes to you in a day or so. At Stanford University in 2005, Bezos said, sometimes people see the problem, and the problem is really annoying them. And they invent a solution. Sometimes you can work this from the backwards direction. And in fact, in high tech, I think a lot of innovation comes from this direction. You see a new technology, or there's something out there, and you work backwards from a solution to find the appropriate problem. Whatever the destructive progress it may have caused, likely we would all agree that Amazon has significantly changed the world. We don't go to the goods, the reverse happens. Elon Musk figured out not only how to make a rocket go up, but also how to make it come back down safely and intact. And then it could be used again and again. Here too, contrarian thinking led to efficiency. When you fly to Paris, you don't throw away your Boeing airplane. Why throw your rocket booster away? Going round trip and reuse brought economy, brought the cost of each rocket launch down 80%. Said Musk, physics is really figuring out how to discover new things that are counterintuitive. Finally, time for some fun. Have you ever noticed that sarcasm is built on opposites, the opposite of what is said, as opposed to what's actually meant. If you say, oh, now that was smart, you mean that was really dumb. The same thing with jokes. Most jokes seem to be based on irony. The word irony seems to come from the Greek word aeron, aeron, person who is a dissembler, a character who is the exact opposite of what he seems to be. Again, with a joke, the intro or the setup leads you in one direction. The concluding punchline jerks you around 180 degrees in the opposite direction. A homonym might have two very different meanings, or a word at the beginning of a phrase and one at the end might be reversed. Here are some of my favorite jokes or witticisms or epigrams. If nothing else, they suggest how the minds of some geniuses run in opposite directions. Mark Twain, quitting smoking is easy. I've done it many times. The coldest winter I ever spent was a summer in San Francisco. Wagner's operas wouldn't sound nearly so bad if it weren't for the music. Ben Franklin, I should probably be proud of my humility. If we don't all hang together, we surely will all hang together separately. 
Abraham Lincoln, better to remain silent than be thought a fool than to speak out and remove all doubt. Albert Einstein, to punish me for my contempt of authority, fate has made me an authority. Oscar Wilde, work is the curse of the drinking class. To lose a parent is a great misfortune. To lose both looks like carelessness. I can resist everything except temptation. True friends stab you in the back. Kanye West, everything I'm not made me everything I am. The most genius thing about the way I create is that I create with other geniuses. On and on we could go, but let's close with a contrarian remark of pianist Oscar Levant. What the world needs is more geniuses with humility. There's so few of us left.